Thank you very much, Dr. White. Thank you very much. <laughs> My Lord. I, I always work without a microphone, as you probably can guess. <laughs> so I'm going to have to talk really quiet. Or I've got to get it. There, now I can talk the way I like to talk without uh, overriding the recorder. Uh, my students don't usually fall asleep in my classes. Uh, so. uh, how many physicists in the crowd? Not too many? Okay, because uh, I don't have any equations or theory. I apologize in advance. Uh, in fact, our, uh, our equations and theory are uh, suitable for analyzing and predicting the behavior of hydraulic fractures in complex naturally fractured rocks are so weak that I wouldn't even dare put anything on the screen and claim that it has any connection to reality whatsoever. Okay? And that's where we are, and that's a problem. We have a conundrum right now in that we're doing massive hydraulic fracturing for shale gas and shale oil development. We want to do massive hydraulic fracturing for things like uh, geothermal development. We do ma massive hydraulic fracturing for uh, injection of slurried solid wastes. I'll show you a couple of pictures. And we don't know how to model it. So, like I say, my, to, say to my students, you know, after I make a point, I say, look, it, this isn't rocket science. It's much, much more difficult. Because the equations in rocket science work. The equations in rock mechanics, at best, are meager approximations of an extremely complex reality that we struggle with all the time. So yeah, we're engineers because uh, that's the only way we can make progress is to take measurements and make, uh, try to make uh, inferences in a, in a practical sense. And, Okay, so uh, well, I'll talk a little bit about hydraulic fracture uses and uh, behavior of a single fracture, maybe. Uh, a little bit about hydraulic fracture uh, processes in naturally fractured strata, like shale gas uh, reservoirs, the Marcellus, the Barnett, and of course the fabulous Horn River shale gas deposit in northern BC, for which you guys will be benefiting by continued exports of natural gas from British Columbia down to northern California, which you already, of course, have. A bit about thermal fracturing, but not, not too much there, just a few random slides interspersed here and there. Uh, a little bit about shale oil and shale gas. Anyway, the uh, massive staged hydraulic fracture technology has changed the U.S. energy picture in ways that, that you understand in the U.S., but it has changed the world energy picture in ways that you don't understand. The shale gas success in the United States is causing Europe to renegotiate their gas contracts with the Russians because of the upcoming advent of relatively economical liquefied natural gas from Canada and the United States, as well as Qatar and, uh, and uh, Abu Dhabi and uh, uh, Trinidad and a few other suppliers. It's having ramifications at the director general level of the European Parliament in Brussels. I was there on last Friday, a week ago, actually, uh, discussing some of, these, some of these things. It's having a huge impact in Europe. And it's having a huge impact in Canada. The advent of shale gas and cheap, uh, cheaper electrical power, for example, is causing the uh, energy providers, the electricity providers in the northeastern part of the United States to knock on Quebec's door. Remember, Quebec is a big exporter of hydroelectric power, and saying, gee, we want you to renegotiate these contracts because if you don't, we're going to put in some natural gas double-stage turbines, which are more efficient than coal turbines, of course, much more. And we're going to just simply produce electrical power at 50% of what you're charging us. So this is going to have a major in economic impact on all of the provinces in my country. Uh, BC, for example, British Columbia and Alberta will no longer be exporting natural gas to uh, eastern Canada. Because U.S. shale gas from Ohio and Pennsylvania is cheaper. Interesting consequences. So massively sta massive staged hydraulic fracture has changed the U.S. energy picture in astounding ways. And of course, we would like to be able to simulate, model, predict, uh, interpret, and uh, we do some stuff like that okay, but not as much as we'd like. But fracturing is much, much more widely used than just for shale gas and shale oil development. Uh, geothermal well fracturing for the extraction of heat, uh, coal bed methane, to introduce thermal energy into uh, high viscosity, uh, heavy oil sands, uh, Alberta, 
California, etc. To measure stresses, it's about the only way that we have to reliably measure stresses deep in the bowels of the earth. Uh, for massive solid waste injection, I'll show you a picture of a Los Angeles waste injection facility here that uh, started up a couple of years ago that I was affiliated with. And many other uses. Uh, the subsurface uses of, uh, uh, based on hydraulic fracturing are increasing substantially. For example, in the geothermal industry, we might drill a couple of wells, create a hydraulic fracture, the large, uh, the large uh, fracture here, and then start circulating uh, cold water in the bottom. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, LBNL has a backup. <laughs> he was listening, you know, and, and when I said something like that, he cursed me. That's, that's for sure. Boy. Well, maybe I'm just not pressing hard enough. I have to sharpen my thumb a little bit here. So anyway, here's my uh, mother fracture, if you wish. And then I start circulating uh, uh, cold water in. The cold water is going in at, you know, 25, 30 degrees Celsius, and the hot water is coming out at 300, 320 degrees Celsius in hot, dry rock cases. Well, if we do a little elastic calculation, we'll see that the stresses are dropping by 200 megapascals, so that the rock is actually thrown into a state of tension. And then we start getting additional fractures being generated. Trust me, simulation of this process is challenging. But it happens. That was first demonstrated in Los Alamos Hot Dry Rock Project uh, back about 25 years ago, and it's still not widely appreciated. Of course, if we're changing the stresses here by hundreds of megapascals, that's tens of thousands of PSI, we're generating huge amounts of micro seismicity. The hot dry rock geothermal project in Basel, Switzerland was shut down a few years ago after four and a half days of cold water injection because the level of micro seismicity was an order of magnitude larger than they had predicted. A hundred million dollar experiment shut down and shut down to this day. So these are not trivial issues, these hydraulic fractures and thermal effects. Uh, and of course, uh, we would like to get this energy down, uh, out, but right now, apparently, the largest barrier to getting out geothermal energy is the induced seismicity associated with massive cooling. And I worked on the geysers project when UNICAL had it and can tell you some interesting things about it. Never had permission to publish it, but anyway, in hydraulic fracture we have some uh, social issues. It's become a bit of a hot button and the blogosphere is rife with sites that, that are really critical of hydraulic fracturing and they have made a mistake. It's not hydraulic fracturing that's dangerous. It's not hydraulic fracturing that's going to have a major impact on the groundwater in the surface. It's surface operations, like a chemical truck driver smoking funny cigarettes. That's a real risk. Hydraulic fracturing is not really a risk. The integrity of the well bore, which has to do with cementation and abandonment techniques, that's a genuine risk, not hydraulic fracturing. So the blogosphere has it wrong, but that's going to change in the next 18 months or 24 months, I'm pretty sure. Why has the reaction been so intense? One, of the rea why, one reason why the reaction is so intense is that in the eastern United States, like Pennsylvania and New York, uh, the people that own the surface rights and have these $2 million and $4 million hobby farms are mainly politicians and hedge fund managers and bankers from New York and Philadelphia and Washington, and they don't own the subsurface mineral rights. Those rights were separated 100 or 120 years ago and sold to somebody else or somebody else. So there they have their beautiful little hobby farm where they're raising an Arabian stallion. And they don't stand to profit from the extraction of the gas beneath their feet. So what is in it for them? Nothing. Except more traffic, more dust, more noise. So they are opposing it extremely, extremely aggressively. And there are big differences between the United States and Canada and between the United States and Europe in these regards because in Canada and the rest of the world, the deep subsurface resources are owned by the state, not by the surface rights owners. So the whole philosophy of development turns out to be quite different. Environmental risks, the risk of breakthrough of fractures to aquifers, we have no known case of that happening yet. Surface spills, spent fuels, disposal, uh, these are uh, real risks spent fluids, well integrity, and of course there's a whole bunch of regulatory issues that are arising. 
Well, the hydraulic fracturing occurs naturally in, in many, many circumstances in nature, and this is just one of them. We have these uh, mid-oceanic ridges here all around the world, and what's happening is that deep in the crust of the Earth, we have some convection cells. And these are moving viscously and slowly, but they are creating extensional strain conditions in the crust, so the horizontal stress drops. When the horizontal stress drops here, this liquid magma wells up. Remember that unpronounceable Icelandic volcano a few years ago that stopped air traffic to Europe for, a couple of, for about a week? Uh, by the way, we give extra points if somebody knows how to pronounce that. Uh, I won't even try. Well, that's actually a hydraulic fracture, a natural hydraulic fracture process. Iceland is growing by hydraulic fracturing. Okay? Or magmatic fracturing, if you wish. So there's Iceland up here, and... Uh, okay, so here we have uh, stress drops pulling apart the crust. And like this, so there's your convection cells, your uh, extensional strain going into a, a condition where your horizontal stress becomes less than the liquid magma down here. And then, of course, that's when you start to get the uh, magma la rising up to the surface. Okay. Magma rises as a hydraulic fracture. And we also see hydraulic fractures around uh, volcanoes. Uh, some of you have been to uh, Ship Rock in uh, New Mexico. And uh, Colorado, there's uh, some volcanoes there that have these nice structures. And some of these dikes that go on for many, many kilometers, these are hydraulic fractures as well. And I could go on and on. There's many, many cases of hydraulic fractures associated with liquefaction. When you had your uh, World Series earthquake here, uh, we had many instances of lined up uh, sand volcanoes, or little sand spews, and they're lined up beautifully along the direction at 90 degrees to the minimum principal stress. So we see that all the time in earthquakes that the liquefaction creates hydraulic fractures that rise to the surface and form uh, structures in line. And uh, here's an example, I believe, of ship rock. And uh, this fracture here is curved. This dike is curved because it's following a curved stress field. And again, here are some more... Uh, Sills and dikes, and sills and dikes are uh, oriented in different orientations as a response to the uh, stress fields that have been uh, that are in place and that are modified by the hydraulic fracturing processes themselves. So, if you want to do some reading, just in the SPE literature alone, there's over 8,000 papers, and that doesn't include the Journal of Geophysical Research and other things. So it's a you know, there's a lot of garbage out there, and you have to really apply your bullshit comb quite carefully to find out the good papers and to read them, and uh, that's what we, we, try to, we try to do that. But remember that about 30% of, of SDE papers are really commercial sales papers, actually maybe even more. And another factor with SDE papers, as opposed to, say, JGR papers, is that uh, SDE papers are generally sunshine stories. You never see a paper written by a petroleum engineer working for ExxonMobil that says, how I made a couple of bad decisions and lost the company $45 million. You never see that, okay? You only see sunshine stories. How I spent $45 million and, you know, the sun was shining and the wind was blowing gently through my hair. And uh, it's, some of these papers are just, you know, you just grit your teeth. But nevertheless, some of them contain tremendous information as well. So we do design. So this is a mathematical model of a half fracture. The black line is the expected stress regime in the ground, and I need that to do fracture simulation. And once I do fracture simulation, I'm going to back up the trucks and start doing something, and then I'm going to take some measurements about the pressures uh, of injection and the rates of injection and try to use that information uh, as well to understand what's going on to help me design my next fractures, etc. So there's a huge amount of empiricism involved. So we make a bunch of conventional assumptions in order to develop a model. And these conventional assumptions, we all know that many of them are not very robust, but we have to make them anyway because our tools are weak. Our tools are weak. We very often assume that a fracture propagates as a single planar surface through a solid material. And you may say, well, that's kind of ridiculous because the materials in which you're hydraulically fracturing are invariably porous. Yeah, that's true. 
we ignore the porosity. We actually do a solid mechanics model. And then you say, well, what about the water? Yeah, well, we get, a, uh, we get rid of the water by what we call a leak-off coefficient. Oh, what's the value of the leak-off coefficient? Well, you know, it might be this, it might be that. You know. So it's very, very empirical. Don't be uh, snowed by somebody who comes up and presents all these hydraulic fracture equations to you and think that you know, this is actually reality. It is a, Ill, uh, pardon me, a weak representation of reality. We assume that the material has an intrinsic resistance to fracture, you know, fracture toughness. So uh, if you take a, a piece of paper, if you wouldn't mind, uh, I can, uh, I can uh, convince you that this material has an inherent fracture toughness. <laughs> I, can't rip it. I can't rip it, but if I put a little wee starter fracture in, whoops, whoops, there, okay. Phew. God, experiments always go awry when you don't at least expect it. Thanks. You can keep the experimental apparatus if you wish. It's, uh... So uh, fractures are affected by natural flaws. I tried to put a natural flaw in there in fracture, and it didn't quite work. But fractures are affected by natural flaws. In fact, many of our rock masses that we fracture in, the fractures themselves, the natural fractures, have no intrinsic cohesion. So they don't have a fracture toughness. Those of you in fracture mechanics know that part of fracture toughness is an implicit tensile resistance. How do we cope with that? The far field stresses are assumed to be spatio-temporally spatio constant. Well, that's not true because if you open up a crack, it has to affect the stress field and maybe quite appreciably. Uh, a single approximately symmetric fracture is uh, created. That's not true. We have many, many cases of fractures being three times longer in one arm than the other arm, depending upon the local stress fields and the stress gradients. But these are what we do for modeling. For example, if we're going to be doing hydraulic fracturing here near a salt dome in the Gulf Coast, we find that because of the, the uh, geology of uh, the tectonic emplacement of that salt dome, we find that the uh, radial stress is the principal stress down here. And the tangential stress is actually very low near the salt dome because the salt dome has pushed out and pulled apart that rock. So if I start fracturing, say, in this well, my fracture starts by shooting towards the salt dome. And when it hits the salt dome, it can't turn an angle because this stress is higher than that stress. So then it goes and starts propagating back in the other direction. Nobody simulates that. But we measure it. We know it's true. There's all kinds of examples where we uh, know things are, uh, are, are modeled in one way, but the reality is different. Local stress fields and stress gradients are critical to the propagation of hydraulic fractures, as well as the fabric of the rock, the presence of joints and planes of weakness. So what do we do? Well, we behave as uh, responsible engineers. Uh, we recognize that models are simplifications, like my model of, of women unfortunately always seems to be a little bit too simple you may not believe this but I swear it's true in our second year of marriage I bought my wife a steam iron for her birthday okay so my model obviously is not sufficiently sophisticated well our models of hydraulic fracture are similar they're not sophisticated enough but we don't know how to make them sophisticated enough we learn more about stresses and geomechanics we take a lot of measurements we do a lot of calibration that's what we do we try to design on an expected behavior uh, that, that our model tells us, but we have to keep our eyes open. We have to be vigilant about unexpected behavior because of the, uh, uh, of the uncertainty about the validity of all of our assumptions. And of course, that's what engineering is about. It's about doing things even though we might not be able to write down all the governing equations. So just a few uh, little comments here. Uh, this is what you would like. By the way, these diagrams only show half of the fracture, OK? Uh, in theory, about, pardon me, it, it, there's another half here. This is what you call a perfect fracture in the pay zone. And uh, reality is that maybe they're horizontal. If the principal, minimum principal stress is vertical, then the fractures will be close to horizontal. Fractures will rise. I'll explain why. Uh, fractures may twist to follow the local stress field. Uh, you might have multiple fractures that are not even horizontal or vertical, but dipping, again, depending upon the local stress fields and how they've been modified. Uh, T-shaped fractures under unusual conditions, and of course, all the time we have out-of-zone growth. So uh, 
we, we have uh, complexity. So in situ stresses are the major control. At that propagating fracture tip, the fracture tip is always sampling the local stress field, and it will tend to propagate at 90 degrees to the least principal stress, and that's just simply first-year physics. It's the principle of work minimization. Now, if it encounters a planar feature that is weaker, the fracture has to make a decision. Does it continue propagating in its own plane, or does it actually change the direction of propagation? So the fracture, being fairly smart, will do a calculation as to the work rate and propagate in the direction that minimizes the work rate. Would it, would it, wouldn't it be nice if we were so smart as to be able to do that in our models? So they propagate normal to sigma 3. Uh, local fracture propagation, however, may differ substantially. Joints, fractures, faults, and other discontinuities, especially in dense rocks like shale gas and shale oil and igneous rocks, are so weak that fractures will tend to propagate locally. And of course, the fracture itself may also uh, uh, induce changes by virtue of its displacement, and maybe by virtue of the fact that we are fracturing with, say, steam at 310 degrees Celsius in the case of heavy oil development. Or maybe, maybe we're fracturing with liquid nitrogen, which is also something that we do more and more of uh, in uh, petroleum engineering uh, well stimulation. Uh, liquid nitrogen has certain advantages. And it also cools the rock by quite a bit, of course. And this changes the stresses massively. All right, so temperature effects, etc. So this, this is what we see in a single fracture propagating in a material with strong fabric. We see that locally, the fabric dominates the propagation direction. But globally, because of the necessity to minimize overall work, the fracture propagates at 90 degrees to sigma 3. So if I drill down and try to sample this fracture by drilling, by coring it, I'll see an orientation of that fracture locally that is not the orientation of the fracture globally. And this, of course, is a classic problem of scale. Once the scale of the fabric is much, much smaller than the scale of the fracture length, essentially, at that point, the fracture propagates normal to sigma 3. So our models assume that. Uh, we have, uh, I'll skip a few slides here. Sure, why not? Just move on to explain why fractures rise. The lateral stress gradient in the, in the Earth is generally in this range, about uh, 17 to 23 kilopascals per meter. In American units, that's on the order of 0.7 to maybe uh, uh, 1 psi per foot. So that's the gradient. Now, in a column of a fracturing fluid, like water, the gradient is much less. The gradient, if I convert that to American units, is about 0.5, maybe 0.55 psi per foot. So that as my crack here, this is my crack, here's my injection point. As it propagates, at the tip of it, if I draw a gradient line for my stresses in the ground and a gradient line for my fluid pressure, the blue line, at the top of it, I have a positive driving force. And at the bottom, I have a negative driving force. So that fractures always rise. And if you want to fracture with uh, liquid nitrogen or, or uh, liquid carbon dioxide, which we do a lot of as well, or gelled propane, the fracture will rise more than if we're fracturing with water. So we try to incorporate that into our models, and some of the models can handle that a little bit anyway. But fractures always rise. Even if they're uh, horizontal, they tend to rise. So here's what will happen in a typical fracture uh, operation, is that the fracture will tend to rise with time. Now, an oil company does not want T4, because this fracture up here represents lost money. So the oil companies and gas companies are very careful to try to design fractures that stay within the zone. Again, using those poor models, but calibrating the models with measurements. Horizontal fractures will also tend to rise uh, simply because of the, of the same reason. The fluid in the fracture is uh, much uh, lower gradient than the lateral stress gradient, so they tend to rise. But then they also tend to skid out along sharp interfaces like between uh, shale and, uh, and the uh, the reservoir that we're, we're trying to fracture. Uh, 
This might be, for example, a heavy oil sand in uh, Bakersfield, California, or something like that, or Alberta. And in this case, for well-known reasons of continuum physics, once my fracture starts to grow, it's going to suppress this arm entirely and grow just solely in that plane. That takes less work than actually having two arms that are rising, and that's easy to show with uh, uh, continuum mechanics. Okay, sometimes fractures don't rise out of the zone. Almost invariably, it has nothing to do with the tensile strength of the rock. Almost invariably, it has everything to do with a non-uniform stress gradient or stress distribution in the rock mass. So here we have, for geological reasons and tectonic reasons, a higher horizontal stress here than here. So the fracture will propagate laterally to minimize work while maximizing area. Okay. And that's uh, what keeps a fracture from rising out of zone. So of course, if you're in a situation where you have a, uh, a uh, geological history that gives you a lower stress above compared to the stress, the horizontal stress here in the reservoir that you wish to stimulate, then your fracture will rise in a relatively uncontrolled manner. And that's, of course, not desirable. There are ways of trying to cope with this, but this is a, a challenging problem. Uh, there's also issues associated with the stress fields in the ground. Everywhere in the world, like West Texas and New Mexico, Colorado, Alberta, where we have uh, a history of deep uh, burial and then erosion, we have a, a stress path, kind of like this, that ends up giving us a higher horizontal stress at the surface than a vertical stress. So that when I do hydraulic fracturing, say, uh, 10 miles north of Denver, Colorado, and I'm only, say, four or 500 meters deep, my fractures will actually be horizontal. And if you see in, around volcanoes, you see a dike rising and then turning into a sill, that's actually a reflection of the stress fields. Down below, the horizontal stress was smaller, but when they rise, rose up to close to the surface, the vertical stress became the smaller stress. So the fracture changed directions once again to try to minimize work and maximize area. So all these things, we try to understand them and, uh, through various techniques. So th this is the uh, orientation of the uh, uh, borehole breakouts in Alberta. Uh, so this means that the principal compressive stress is basically tectonic in origin, and it's pretty well at, uh, you know, normal to the mountain front. So if I go here and I do hydraulic uh, fracturing, my hydraulic fractures are going to propagate this way. Down here, they're going to propagate that way. Up here, they're going to propagate that way. And uh, we like to know that because that tells us how we're going to drill our well. If I'm drilling one of these really long shale gas wells, horizontal wells, I want to drill that well parallel to the direction of the least compressive stress. That way, my hydraulic fractures will tend to be at 90 degrees to the wellbore, which gives me the best treatment. Uh, I put in too many slides, as I usually do, so you know, I get overly enthusiastic about my subject. So. Uh, fracture direction changes. A fracture uh, will push the rock apart. Therefore, the, the pressures have to be higher than sigma 3. And as the fracture length grows, the aperture also must grow. Uh, and this increases the, the, the stress. I mean, you can't push against the world without the world pushing back. Now, most of the models assume that the lateral stress is constant. The reality is, is that as I expand my fracture, the lateral stress will rise. So at some point, the fracture might change directions. Furthermore, there's a little important point here in terms of fracture volume. You hear in the blogosphere and on, uh, you know, in, inferred by, by uh, irresponsible uh, uh, pseudo-documentaries like Gasland, it is inferred that the fracture will rise up to the surface. Well, suppose I have a 100-meter high zone, and I design a fracture to remain within that zone because I don't want to lose money. And then I ask the question of myself, how much more volume would it take to, ex uh, to extend that another 100 meters higher? Well, let's see. The volume of a fracture is roughly proportional to the length times the height, times the aperture. So if I double my height, I have to increase my volume by a factor of eight. Uh, 
So the probability of a petroleum person making an error of a factor of eight is fairly low, although not impossible. So, but, so fractures will rise out of zone, but not hundreds and hundreds of meters. That would require, you know, that would require huge amounts of water, like two or three orders of magnitude larger than the amounts of water that we actually use in fracturing. So fractures do not rise out of zone to contaminate aquifers, you know, two kilometers higher up. It doesn't happen. All right, so, but, but fractures will change the directions, and that could be good because that provides more surface contact area for drainage of shale gas or for uh, extraction of heat because uh, all of these diffusion controlled processes like Darcy flow and heat flux are all related to surface area and gradient, of course. Uh, just showing you that the stress fields are not constant, even in nature. This is a map of the dikes near Spanish peaks. Uh, this is the uh, Sangre de Cristo mountains here. And look at these dikes, how they are curved. They're following the local stress fields that have been perturbed as a result of the igneous activity. So we always want to know that. And, uh, and uh, David Pollard of Stanford uh, did some fabulous work many years ago on this subject. His papers are really worth reading on this. He did a very simple mathematical finite element simulation. And by gosh, his uh, little vectors here are, are just so beautifully lined up that you'd think that he fudged it. Well, he did calibrate it, but he didn't fudge it. Okay, so uh, we'll move on. Now here's the big problem with shale gas and shale oil is how do we cope with high naturally fractured strata? You can see here that uh, we have bedding planes and natural fractures, and we have uh, features at uh, all scales and all sizes. One of the larger natural uh, fractures uh, in the world, of course, is uh, ju just, just over there. It's called the San Andreas Fault, and it's a natural shear fracture that is many thousands of kilometers long, all the way down to micro cracks that are on the order of microns. All right, so we have discontinuities at all scales, all, all, and all relevant engineering scales in the crust of the earth and in natural rocks, and coping with these are uh, challenging. And of course, we generate models. So here's just a brief list, uh, stim frac, frac man, gopher, frac pro, etc. These are uh, just a very brief list. The list is, could be three times as long of commercial, prod, uh, commercial uh, software. And this is a typical commercial software simulation. Here's the stress that they deduced by some poor measurements. Here is the width profiles from the mathematical model. And here is the extension of the fracture laterally from the mathematical model. So that kind of model is used widely. And then we try to collect some data to calibrate the model to make it more practically useful in real circumstances. OK. For shale gas and shale oil, basically what we're doing is we're drilling a long horizontal well here on the order of two to three kilometers long. And we're doing this multi-stage fracturing along the axis of the well, generally 15 to 20 stages. So each stage is maybe 100, 150 meters away from the previous stage. And we work from the toe to the heel and try to create as much surface area as we can so we take very aggressive actions. Looked, uh, looked at a little bit differently. And I have deliberately drawn these uh, zones here uh, uh, of fracture uh, stimulation, not as a single plane, but as a zone. Because we are so aggressive with our injection that we actually open up additional fractures through two processes, wedging and shear, which I'll now kind of describe. So we actually do not create a single fracture. We actually open up a fracture network. Some of these are filled with sand prop them open, but other way, others are self-propping. We do this with horizontal wells. I just put this in to show you that, you know, horizontal wells are not old. This is 2002, and the Barnett Shale, this is the Barnett Shale development uh, with uh, vertical wells uh, and horizontal wells. So you can see it's all vertical wells until about 2002, and now it, by 2009, 100% horizontal wells. We don't drill vertical wells for shale oil or shale gas anymore, anywhere, ever. And here's some developments, uh, technical developments, like microseismic monitoring, which uh, we're still working very hard on to try to understand what it's telling us. Uh, the first use was back in about 1995. Well, actually, I'm going to lay claim on that one. I used microseismic monitoring in 1981 
in Alberta, and I think that's the first use uh, in, uh, in the petroleum industry. Trouble is, the petroleum industry was absolutely, totally, completely uninterested at the time. So I moved on to other things, being, you know, being a bit of a prostitute academic. You've got to keep the money coming in for students, so you move on to subjects that companies will pay for. So I abandoned that, and now it's become a, a, a nice thing. Here's the kind of media that we're dealing with. This, this is the Colorado oil sands at a weathered outcrop surface here, so you can see the cracks opening up. But down below, those cracks might indeed be partially closed. Uh, I went to Indonesia here last June to uh, look at shale gas and shale oil prospects in a sedimentary basin in Sumatra. And we were able to find a mine that is mining coal. And this is the overburden. Uh, and this, this rock contains about 8% organic material. So it's a wonderful oil and gas generating rock here at the surface, but in the middle of the basin, it's down 3,000 meters. So it's generating oil and gas, and that's the, this is the source rock. So we went to have a look at the source rock and look at all these beautiful fractures in this orientation. And, and uh, just like today, I, I needed a haircut then, and I need a haircut now. So. And you can see the, uh, the, the fracture surfaces here. Uh, this is at 90 degrees, of course, to, to these. And... Uh, Here's a question. How does this look at depth? I can go and do outcrop work all the time. What is at depth? Is it open? Is it closed? I can do these kind of analyses and pick up all kinds of families of joints and fractures and faults and fissures, but how do you project that down to depth? This is a big problem. We don't know how to do that well. Now, some of you, I've, Joe told me, are doing work on backscattered seismics. Backscattered seismics is a way of evaluating fracture density in a kind of a homogenized method, methodology. And we're quite interested in that because it should be able to give us more information about the nature of fractures at depth. But the one problem is, if the fracture is an incipient fracture, but it's closed, does, do we have any backscattered seismic uh, uh, energy? Mm. So here's our perception. We have these uh, fractured rock masses. We have a stress field. Uh, we have some uh, uh, cracks that are open and some cracks that are incipient. And these uh, are stimulated, if you wish, by the two processes of wedging and shear. So wedging is basically the rigid block on a table. And I am opening it up by injection of fluid. Here is a closed fracture, and I'm raising the pore pressure very high above the minimum principal stress, which is acting in this direction here, roughly, roughly, maybe actually at an angle, I'll get onto that in a moment, and that when I lower my actual effective stress here by increasing the pore pressure up to a certain point, it shears. And when it shears, it creates self-propped aperture. Now we have a permeable path. Now shale gas can drain. Now shale oil can move towards the production of wellborn. So those are the two processes. We're just beginning to learn how to simulate some of these shearing processes in a rock with strong fabric. We know, in a sense, what's, what, what we have to do. For example, if this is my major principal compressive stress and that's my minor principal compressive stress, I know that for a given, a, a given feature, I have some kind of a shear criterion. So that's shear stress expressed in the more Coulomb uh, 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 diagram. And I know that only cracks with this failure line in this angle here will actually shear. So that means that these angles here are the shear angles. That's where my joints will open. Trouble is, Joints have different roughness, so there is no such thing as a unique more Coulomb failure line for all joints. Every single joint has a little bit different roughness, a little bit different uh, cementation, so they all have... So we're, we're, we're again running into a very, very non-deterministic problem here. So we use simple models. Here's one of my little cartoons. If I create a hydraulic fracture in this relatively rigid, uh, naturally, naturally fractured rock, I see that I have block rotation, block shear here, uh, joint opening. And look at the aperture down here and the aperture up here. So I was injecting sand and water 
in, you know, in a sense. And that's the extent of the sand, the red line. But you can see that the effects are going much, much, much further than what I'm actually uh, achieving. So these uh, next slides come from Carlos Santa Marina in Georgia Tech, a, a colleague of mine. And they're just very indicative. So he's going to create a fracture here in this jointed rock mass. And I want you to look at the huge changes in permeability that are going to arise because of the shearing and the aperture opening, wedging, wedging and shearing, block rotation, out at distances that might be two and three times the actual characteristic length of the fracture. And those are the ones we have trouble simulating. We really have a lot of trouble. So there you go. You can see again the big cracks. And this is a, a just, he's just going to push up on this little block down here just to show you how rigid block motion propagates through a system much, much more uh, than you would uh, expect and has major changes on permeability. All right, so here we are again with our naturally fractured medium. And we are propagating a fracture in the single plane fracture, if you want to call this a single plane fracture, is again propagating globally at 90 degrees of sigma 3 but locally at, uh, at the uh, angle dictated by the presence of the strong fabric, which, in principle, we don't know all the details about. Uh, it's a, there's a huge uh, uncertainty component here. The strength of the intact rock is not really relevant in this case. Those joints are probably open. So there is no such thing as a genuine fracture toughness as defined by uh, continuum mechanics equation. We have a pseudo-fracture toughness. So that fracture toughness coefficient is used as a calibration factor, sometimes, sometimes a little bit too enthusiastically, I might add. If we go a little bit more locally, we'll see why the fractures change direction. So here's sigma 3 in that orientation. So sigma 1, sigma h max, is in this orientation here. And as I open up this crack, it no longer has the ability to sustain any frictional resistance. Therefore, it undergoes displacement across the fracture walls in this sense of motion here. In this case, it's left lateral. So above this, this, this plane, the normal stresses on this surface are increased, but to the left of this plane, below it, the normal stresses are actually diminished. So now the normal stress right here is much less than the normal stress here or here, so the fracture changes directions locally. And again, tries, uh, continues to do this and tries to maintain in the large scale, uh, uh, an orientation of about 90 degrees of sigma 3. We know the math now. This problem in 2D has been solved actually in a semi-analytical solution. And we can use finite elements and all this kind of stuff. But we're starting to get into an area of computational intens uh, intensity here that is astounding. And our models are not that. So here's the kind of picture that we have. We have a zone here that is, uh, we call it the sand limit, where we're injecting sand, and maybe the sand gets into, but the pore water pressure propagates very, very efficiently. The pressure propagates very efficiently. Maybe the water never even gets here, but the pore water pressure gets there, and it w opens up these cracks and causes them to sh slip, and I can measure that with microseismic emissions. So what we see is that the global cloud of microseismic emissions is much larger than any volume that we would suspect has actually seen contact with sand. So we talk about the sand volume and the stimulated volume. So this is wedging dominated in here. And farther out, it's shear dominated. And again, just a little picture, uh, uh, again, showing you the sand in here and these little red arrows indicating the directions of shear that I would expect in that stress field. All right, so we can measure the microseismic uh, events. This is courtesy of Craig uh, Cipolla, who uh, now works for Hess in Houston. So here we have a, uh, and this is a long time ago, but it's still perfectly valid. This is, I believe, in 2006, 2004 here. So here is my horizontal well, and I have six zones open for, uh, by perforations. And there are two monitoring wells here, observation wells, with a geophone array. So we can pick up the uh, extent and location of the microseismic events. So we're going to do several different things. We start off with a gel frac, and then we, start off, then we do something else. And then we end up with 12 hours here of injection of uh, something we call 
slick water. And slick water is just ordinary everyday tap water to which you have added a small fraction of a polyacrylamide. And this reduces the friction of the water as it passes through a very narrow aperture crack. So it allows us to inject farther out at greater volumes with a given pressure. Slick water fracturing is essentially about 10 years old, and it has also been one of the elements of the shale gas revolution. So let's look at the microseismic emissions from the first cross-link gel fracture. And you see that here's the well bore right here. It's very relatively close by. Uh, and you can see all the location of the microseismic emissions. And I told you earlier that fractures tend to rise except where the stress conditions say they shouldn't, which is rare. But here's a case where the fractures actually tended to go down rather than go up. Local stress conditions are important. So for the next stage of stimulation, the uh, gray one, uh, a very short stage, it stayed locally. But look at what happened in the slick water stage. Wow. We're going out. I mean, this is 500 feet. We're now getting stimulation out here 225 meters away, 200 meters away. This is good news. And furthermore, that fracture is not rising up to the surface. That fracture is propagating laterally. And the reason for that, of course, is that the horizontal stress here is probably higher in the cap rock than it is in the reservoir. So this is the Barnett Shale in, in, uh, near Dallas, Fort Worth, in Texas. All right. So in order to try to improve our models, we're, uh, we're starting an experiment. Uh, Joe, uh, Dr. Wang here knows a little bit about it. I sent him some stuff. One of the problems with hydraulic fracture uh, modeling is that we never get a chance to really uh, rip apart the ground and see what the fracture did. So starting actually uh, here in the United States, uh, and uh, Lawrence Berkeley was involved, uh, there was a, uh, a fracturing experiment where we had mine back. And there have been several of these done, and we are going into a, another uh, episode of doing this in deep underground mines. The first experiment is going to be in Australia in, in May, and uh, then in uh, the Sudbury Basin in Canada in uh, following years, and maybe elsewhere, depending upon what partners come on board. And this is funded partly about 50% by the mining industry and 50% by the petroleum industry with, uh, with uh, uh, matched contributions coming from provincial and federal governments in Canada. So we have actually six goals to better characterize the rock mass, because when you do hydraulic fracturing, as I showed you, you generate microseismic emissions. Now, for you seismologists, these are distributed source functions. So you can collect the wave trains coming to you from these source functions and do a tomographic inversion and get a lot, lot more detailed information about the structure of the rock mass. So that's one reason we're doing this, to try to develop that technology. Second to see if it's possible to relieve the stress on critically stressed features. A critically st stressed feature in a mine, if it suddenly releases its energy, it's called a, a, a fault slip, or more locally, a strain burst, and it kills people. And we want to be able to understand about them and maybe relieve the stress. So if we inject high pressure fluid, maybe the stresses can be relieved, the shear stresses can be relieved along these features. Goal number three, to trigger caving without blasting. The mine called the uh, Newcrest Mine in Cadia, Australia, that we're going to be doing some work in in May, they have developed hydraulic fracturing as a means of bringing down rock in, a, in, a, in an open stope without having to drill holes in dynamite. So they drill holes and use very aggressive fracturing as opposed to uh, blasting. And that turns out to have some advantages in many cases. Number four rock mass compliance modification. If we can change the stiffness, the modulus of the rock mass, then it's going to respond to the stress field changes differently when we do tunneling and opening. And then that, if we do that right, we should be able to reduce risk. Uh, number five, to test hydraulic fracture models in, in, uh, in naturally fractured rocks. Well, it turns out that the stiffness of the shale gas and shale oil strata is not really that different than the stiffness of hard rock, a factor of five which sounds like a lot, but it's actually not. For example, if you compare it with oil sands, then it would be a factor of 100 or more. But also, igneous rock tends to be impermeable. Well, shale gas strata and shale oil strata also tend to be almost impermeable. So the oil industry, six companies, I think, five, six, including Exxon, uh, 
uh, have come on board. We have to be a little bit careful with Exxon because Exxon always likes to take over projects. So we're going to have to be uh, pleasant but firm uh, to pursue our science goals as well as the uh, goals of engineering and safety. And this is my, one of my contributions to this, to test out the elasto, the thermoelastic stress management concept. Here's the fault slip concept. We've got a critically stressed feature here, a fault that is close to rupture. So we put in a monitoring borehole. We put in another borehole with packers. And we inject high pressure fluid here to try to create that, uh, to try to make that shear. And by shearing, relieve the magnitude of shear stress under control conditions. In other words, if we do it ourselves under control conditions, we're not going to kill anybody. We'll, we'll have everybody out of the mine when we do this. The hydraulic fraction will be done remotely. If we let nature take its course and decide to have a slip when it decides, then the risks are far, far higher. So we're looking to modify the, uh, modify the stresses along some of these critically stressed features uh, as we identify them. Uncontrolled fault slip is a major risk for deep underground mining, and we're going deeper and deeper all the time. In Canada right now, the mantra is deeper, faster, cheaper, safer. I'm sorry, wrong order. I was corrected about this before. And the mining engineer said, Maurice, safety, then deeper, faster, and cheaper. So we're going down to three kilometers now, three and a half kilometers, where the stresses are pretty high, and we have to be very concerned about these things. Now, if you take a, 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 an inclusion like this in a continuum or whatever, you know, in a rock, and you cool it, you get a stress transfer. So here, your compressive stress is lost, and it's transferred away from the inclusion. The same thing happens, of course, in the, along this BB axis. We have a loss of the uh, horizontal stress here, and the stress is transferred above and below. Now, we've known this, of course, in mechanics for generations, and we're using it now in petroleum engineering and some applications on purpose. So we have uh, this cooled inclusion concept. Zones of low radial stress and high tangential stress around the inclusion. And of course, if I have a fault or a large planar feature here, I'm going to be reducing the, uh, reducing the uh, normal stress across that fault quite massively, and maybe, again, doing stress relief as I cool the rock mass. So then, inside of this cool region, since you can see my stress trajectories here, the stresses are going around the inclusion. In here, I have a much, much lower stress level, compressive stress level in all directions than I do in the surrounding rock mass. But that's okay because in the surrounding rock mass, it's confined. So then I'll advance my tunnel here, and it's going to be in a, what do we call a stress shadow. Oh, we'll skip that. That's too much. So here's the concept. Here's my tunnel going into high-stressed rock. I'm going to drill some holes. And I'm going to create hydraulic fractures. And I'm going to circulate chilled calcium chloride brine at minus 30 degrees Celsius. Now, the rock mass down here, three kilometers deep, is 75 degrees Celsius. So I'm getting about 100 or 90 or 100 degrees Celsius cooling here. And I can just write down a little equation that shows you that the stress changes are on the order of 50 to 100 megapascals for a typical igneous rock. These are very, very large. So now I've created a, essentially a, a stress shadow in this cool zone. And I can uh, then advance the tunnel into that zone and repeat the process. My calculations suggest that the cooling period is sufficiently would be about three weeks, four weeks. So that should not interfere with mining too much because there's always something else to do in the mine anyway. So in order to try to understand this, we're doing mathematical modeling. And for those of you that are into mathematical modeling, we're combining finite difference for the uh, diffusive uh, flux with boundary element techniques called displacement discontinuity three kinds, displacement discontinuity and boundary element, which are both types of boundary models, along with a, a continuum model, which is a finite difference model for the flux. And uh, here is the uh, pressure migration in a fractured rock mass. And here are the uh, actual uh, stresses uh, in the, sorry, temperatures in the fractured rock mass. And as you can see, we have uh, uh, cooling 
gradually moving its way into the blocks. And of course, the cooling is the greatest where my fracture is. My fracture is right here. And way out here, I'm getting flux, but the cooling is just beginning. Now that is a very, very strongly coupled problem because the cooling shrinks the rock. The aperture opens. And if you remember Paul Witherspoon, cubic law. So I'm changing the permeability. I, I don't, I shouldn't use the word permeability. I'm changing the fracture conductivity literally by orders of magnitude here, by, by thermoelastic cooling in this case. Or if I was putting in hot water, it would be in the opposite direction. I would actually be squeezing those cracks together. But they respond very, very differently in compression than they do in extension. Extremely different. Extremely different. So we're trying to build models to understand that. And that's just uh, one of the models of a student who's defending in about, about six weeks, uh, Mohammed Reza Jalali, a very smart guy. Uh, and here's some of his uh, uh, horizontal effective stress and vertical effective stress calculations for, for that model as well. So, of course, we're doing a very, very regular model, but the one he's working on right now, and uh, hopefully he'll make some progress, uh, is trying to look at the uh, uh, case where we have uh, oriented planar features that are oriented at an angle to the principal stresses. So now we have shear. And he's also formulating an empirical shear dilation coefficient so that if he has, say, two, two millimeters or three millimeters of shear, he adjusts completely empirically. He adjusts the uh, conductivity of that crack uh, in proportion, not linearly, in proportion to this, uh, to this shear. So here are the directions of movement uh, in this uh, anisotropic stress field. These move this way, and these move this way, uh, etc. So you can see the little arrows here. And... Uh, here are the apertures in millimeters uh, from, his, uh, from his calculations, uh, again, using an empirical link between the aperture and the amount of displacement. And I say empirical because there's no way that we'll ever be able to do this rigorously because all fractures have different roughnesses. So a very rough crack, if I can even succeed in shearing it, will be much more dilatant than a very smooth crack. Smooth crack. So those are some of the things we're trying to do uh, and we, th we think that this mine stuff has some financial advantages because uh, uh, we can improve our models and then we can mine back. So, for example, if you're an oil company uh, or a service company like Halliburton and you want to test out one of your models, well, fine. Here are the parameters. Make a type 1 prediction. A type 1 prediction is a prediction before the fact. Type 2 prediction is after the fact or a history map. So make a type 1 prediction, then we're going to do things, and then we're going to mine through and actually see it. And we don't do that in petroleum engineering. So many of our model, models are totally unconstrained. Well, not totally, but largely unconstrained. Better understanding of the physics, courtesy of the mine back potential, and ability to test ideas at a cost of about one-tenth. Uh, our experiment, which is going to be on the order of our experiments, four or five millions of dollars at this stage, maybe a bit more in the future, uh, basically, to do the same experiments uh, in the petroleum industry would be $100 million. Because in a mine, I can drill a uh, 2 and 7 eighths inch hole at a cost literally of 1 20th the cost per meter, or 1 30th the cost per meter of drilling a, a hole from the surface. And also, we're going to be about 2 and a half to 3 kilometers deep. So the stresses are going to be very, very relevant for the uh, kind of depth that we're doing shale gas and shale on. Uh, okay, better design of shale oil and liquids rich uh, shale gas stimulations. We're going to be looking at gas stimulation as well. Uh, there's some advantages to trying to use something with a fairly high flux rate, like uh, using rocket propellant. Again, a technology which was first suggested by people working in the national laboratories here in the United States and uh, has developed a technology uh, uh, that is now being used actually uh, in the oil industry, a uh, gas rack. And uh, that company is, was actually based upon technology developed by, uh, by the NAT labs. Uh, I can't remember if it was the LBL or Sandia. I think it was Sandia, actually. So that's what uh, is going to take me on into my next stage of retirement. Okay. So I'm 66, so I can look forward to this one keeping me busy for the next five years. And then my poor wife is going to have to realize that I'm going to try to find something else to keep me busy for the next five years as well. Just in final, uh, in, in final comments, 
Uh, this is a slurry, uh, slurried solids fracture injection site in Duri. Before this was established in 2002, Duri was one of the filthiest oil fields in the world. Now, Duri, which is 50% owned by Chevron, is 90% waste, uh, waste injected. 90%, what do they call it? Um, not waste free, but 90% uh, of the way towards zero impact in terms of solids and liquids. There used to be huge pits back in the jungle here full of crap. And all that stuff is now is down about 700, 600 meters, courtesy of this injection facility. These are the pumps right here. That's just the sump. And uh, as you can see, they, they put all these nice little stones. Everything goes so nicely and so that they try to keep the workers busy by painting little stones. Yeah. And this is uh, biosolids injection. Uh, under, by the way, of course, the solids injection is under hydraulic fracture conditions. And, and since we're putting in thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of cubic meters per well, we're changing the stresses massively, and we just don't know how to simulate that. Now, in Los Angeles, we're actually getting rid of uh, biosolids, the sludges from biosolids. Instead of spreading them on strawberry fields, we uh, are putting them, uh, the city of Los Angeles is putting them through uh, primary and secondary treatment. And then the sludges are being injected at depth uh, in a depleted oil field about 1,300 meters deep. So each one of us, as you are well aware, generates about 0 0.5 kilograms per day of dry, solid waste. And uh, this is being injected here. And uh, there's the injection well. Here. There's the pumping system. And you can drive right by this uh, down in Los Angeles if you like. So the company doing this, uh, I used to be affiliated with them, can truthfully say that your ship is my bread and butter. Okay? We use that, of course, naturally. In conclusion, I've taken a 10 minutes more than I should have. Uh, hydraulic fracture use is increasing in many, many applications, uh, waste disposal, geothermal, and, uh, of course, in the oil and gas industry. The stresses and the stress changes that happen during hydraulic fracturing are first order controls. We have to understand them, and these stress changes occur courtesy of the volume changes arising from changes in temperature, changes in pressure, and changes in effective stress. So this is what we call a THM model, thermal, thermal hydromechanically coupled model. And it uh, keeps graduate students uh, you know, in a state of stress quite, quite, quite regularly a difficult problem to solve. The computational requirements are sometimes just so heavy that we just stick to 2D problems or very simple 3D ones. In general, our models are quite weak, especially in fracturing and naturally fractured rock masses, in fracturing and rock masses with complex stress distributions and complexity in terms of the stiffness parameters and other physical properties. Uh, in cases of very, very massive hydraulic fracturing, such as the uh, slurried solids injection, which is two orders of magnitude or, or an order of magnitude at least more than a typical shale gas stimulation process, no, two orders of magnitude, because that well is injected day after day for maybe six hours a day for literally three, four years. So the volumes are just uh, huge. In weak shearing and dilating strata, for example, in things like high porosity on consolidated sands or stuff like diatomite or your high porosity sands up here or down there rather in Bakersfield where they inject steam under hydraulic fracturing conditions and really don't know much about what happens except that they try to measure uh, a bit. And that brings me to the final conclusion here is that this is such a, an uncertain and complex process that monitoring is a vital aspect of uh, of continued development of hydraulic fracturing models and calibration of these models to, re to realistic situations. So I'd like to thank Sarah and Joe and LBNL for inviting me down and, of course, the people that I work with. So thank you. I'd like to understand more about the role of propant. You use this wedge analogy. Is the propant um, as much to initially open the fracture as it is to keep it open, or is it just to keep it open? Just to keep it open. We can, we can make a fracture nice and fat just with a high viscosity liquid. 
fracture sand is forced into there so that when I stop injecting and the pressure decays, the fracture closes onto the sand and forms a high permeability pad. Do they close after your stress relief? Well, if a fracture is just wedged as a result of liquid, when I relieve the pressure, that fracture just closes, and it's probably mostly closed. But if I have a differential stress field, so that I have shear stress, and if I open up this crack at an angle to my principal stresses, if I can open it up, it's going to go going to shear. It's going to move by maybe a few millimeters. Now the crack is always rough so that when it moves it doesn't fit back again. We call that self-propping. So a shear crack will always self-prop. A wedged crack will not prop of itself except when we put in the sand to maintain it open as a prop in general. There are, th that's a reasonable approximation of, of the reality. You're gonna, you're gonna wait a long time. <laughs> I, I, I was a little put, bit put up two hands. <laughs> I was a little confused about the advantages of, of hot materials versus cold materials. I sure. understood you to say that the hot materials actually help close. They'll swell, cause swelling, I guess, and close fractures. But then they're doing steam and hot water injections as well as. Oh boy, fluids, right? uh, that, that's another two-hour talk. Okay. No, no, no. Seriously, it's a real, it's a real important issue uh, for, in heavy oil. Uh, we now understand uh, that when you start creating a very, very high temperature inclusion, it changes the stress fields around the, uh, the leading edge of the inclusion so much that we, that we force these dense sands to shear and dilate. So the porosity will go from 29, 28% up to 33, 34%. So we actually measure ground surfaces that lip go up by a meter because of a process that's down 300 meters. Now, when we do our thermoelastic calculations, we say, boy, from a thermoelastic point of view, that should have gone up 10 centimeters. So that remaining 90 centimeters can only be attributed to shear dilation. And that's another whole kettle of fish uh, that, uh, that, that uh, requires a lot, a lot more time. But it, the, the, what we're looking at from the modeling point right now is the uh, changes of stresses associated with uh, hot liquid or preferably in mining case cold liquid injection to create a, a your stresses that go away from that cool zone so then you can tunnel through it uh, quickly support your rock mass with rock bolts and concrete in under safe conditions so in that case uh, in order to simulate we have this shrinkage of the blocks which increases the aperture of the blocks which means that if I'm injecting between here and here Instead of my flow going nicely and uniformly, my flow is maybe only going down a few cooled fractures, which is bad news. So we're looking at how this is going to impact our design for the thermoelastic stress experiments, which should be done in about two years. So it's, it's complex, but, but we understand that we're going to have to at least be able to, maybe not quantify, but at least describe the physics in a way that, that other people can sit down and help us cure these these issues. We might end up trying to plug fractures, actually, if we create apertures that is too wide. We might end up putting something in to plug it to force the cold water to flow into a larger volume. Or we might, be, we might say, well, we can't do this with two wells. We have to do it with four or maybe six wells to create uh, a larger volume or a flow, uh, flow regime that we can successfully cool. Yeah. A, lot of, a lot of little subtleties in here that... Uh, Art McGar at the U.S. Geological sure. Survey gave an interesting <laughs> paper at the AGU meeting um, yeah. suggesting that the at least largest magnitude earthquakes is dependent upon the total vol volume of fluid injected. So maybe it doesn't apply tremendously to fracking for well, shale gas, but what about these large-scale injections? I mean, well, I'm, I'm talking to a guy here, you know, who uh, probably can bring out a hammer and nails and crucify me pretty quickly if I come into error here in the mechanics side of it. He's uh, got a stellar reputation in this area. Um, we, uh, here, here's a typical, you know, uh, I'm a reporter and here's a 
an attractive young uh, geophysicist, uh, you know, and uh, the reporter says, you know, uh, Pauline, as a geophysicist, can you guarantee us that your hydraulic fracturing operation will not trigger a much larger earthquake, you know, the straw that breaks the camel's back, Pauline? And Pauline says, well, it's not possible for me to absolutely guarantee that, but, oh, thank you, great interview. And that's what's happening in the media. Okay. This is a typical Fox News. Oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. But hey, I am in a blue uh, state, aren't I? So I can say that, all right. I wouldn't say that down in Bakersfield. You know, I'd get crucified. But uh, this is a typical problem that we have, is that the media does not explain the science. Okay. All right, to go back to uh, Art's question. In an unstressed, in an unstressed rock mass, uh, any kind of energy that we put in is essentially the volumetric potential that we're putting in because of the fracture uh, fluid going in. But in a rock mass that is strongly pre-stressed and close to a condition of criticality, there is a non-zero probability. It might be many, many zeros, but it's a non-zero probability that it could trigger a larger seismic event through stress transfer. That has been recognized. For example, the British Geological Survey came out six, eight months ago with their hydraulic fracturing recommendations after a few earthquakes were generated up in uh, northwestern uh, uh, Eng uh, England by uh, shale gas uh, exploration. And they said uh, those were unusual conditions, and they injected very close to some faulted features, and we recommend that this should not be done. You should stay away from faults in the future. And I think that that's a, a fair statement. There is a non-zero probability. But as you know, the magnitude of an earthquake that you can generate by hydraulic fracture injection is down in fairly small Richter numbers unless you have a pre-existing critically stressed feature. It's, it is a little bit sobering to, re to remember that the second largest earthquake ever recorded in Alberta to this date is still as a result of water injection for water flooding. In Ohio, we have the magnitude 4.2, 4.4 earthquakes generated. Now, you might say, well, that's hydraulic fracture. Sorry, that's not hydraulic fracture. What they're doing there is disposing of massive, massive volumes of cool water two things that they fail to take into account. One is that there's also a stress redistribution associated with the cooling, as I tried to convince you here in my slides. And the other one is that they do some tests early on, and they say, oh, well, here's the fracture pressure, and here's what we're going to inject at. It's going to be no problem. But they change the stresses over volumes that are much larger than the volumes of the water that they're injecting. As you know, pressure travels far, much farther than the water. So what they're doing is they're creating a change in stress over volumes now that are 10, 100, maybe 500 times the volume of a hydraulic fracturing job. They're talking about kilometers, many kilometers, kind of like the Colorado injection back in the 1950s. That was interesting because they decided that the best thing to do would be to inject these wastes into an impermeable rock. And nowadays, they say, ooh, bad idea. <laughs> Bad idea. That's exactly the way to generate earthquakes, is to inject it into an impermeable rock that doesn't allow the pressures to dissipate. So I know I'm, I'm waffling a, a little bit here, but uh, essentially the Ohio wells were the result of a very, very large volume that was affected by the pressures. And I, uh, when I heard about these things uh, before the well was shut down here a few weeks ago, I just was gritting my teeth and saying, God damn arrogant engineers again. Why didn't they drill a second well? Why don't they do something? It's not like it's rocket science. Well, I shouldn't use that analogy, but it's not like it's, uh, it's uh, unknown. If you have another injection well 10 kilometers away or 20 kilometers away, well, then you can maybe do these kind of things and allow the pressure to dissipate with time. But maybe not. Maybe not. I'm also a consultant to the Paradox Valley Saline Water Injection Unit. And as you know, in January, that was shut down because of a 4.4 earthquake. The irony is, is that we filed our report about three days before the earthquake. I won't tell you then what we said in the report, but uh, as a scientist, I always reserve the right to change my mind when confronted with the facts. I don't have an explicit answer to the seismicity issue, but uh, I'm not a geophysicist by training, but uh, it's, uh, it is one of the... Uh, one of the issues of uncertainty that we have to come to grips with and be very clear to the public about uh, 
what we know and what we don't know and what the odds are. And I think we can put risk numbers on it. I would say we could probably put risk numbers on it. We have enough information around the world, I think, on induced seismicity that if somebody brought that all together, we could probably come up with a kind of a, a, a some, you know, 95% probability plus or minus. You know. <laughs> And doing just that. Yeah, me too. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I, I uh, advised the Alberta government on the uh, Shell Quest project up in Alberta, and uh, they asked me to come up with a bunch of questions for them to ask the, um, the Shell people. And I said, I'll give you the questions, but I'll also tell you exactly how they'll answer because I know how I would answer if I was in their shoes. And uh, it's pretty straightforward that they answered that, that way. But it's really irrelevant because Shell has the best CO2 injection site in the entire world. It's 1.6, 1.7 kilometers deep. It's in, a, it's in what we call a sub-basin, and sub-basin is like a bathtub like this. So their formation is actually sealed hundreds of kilometers away in all directions. And they had three regionally continuous salt zones between them and the Cretaceous sediments. So they have so many barriers. That lower zones has only been penetrated by three wells within a 100-kilometer radius. So they, you know, they, they, they just can't do any better. And sure enough, of course, Shell is still planning to go ahead, of course. And uh, we'll see. The trouble is with Shell is that they want to keep all the data themselves. And this is being paid for 75% by taxpayer money. So we'll see what happens. I hope the data come out so we can all look at it and start applying our models. CO2. I see. Can you talk about a little bit more about CO2 as the fracture of fluid? Sure. CO2, uh, when, we, when we're going to be injecting CO2, we're not going to be injecting it at a temperature that is too much different than the temperature of the rock. Maybe 15 degrees Celsius or 20 degrees Celsius different than the rock temperature. So first of all, thermoelastic stress changes are going to be relatively small. When I'm talking about steam, we're talking about 300 degrees Celsius delta T. When we're talking about cooling in a rock mass, a very, very stiff rock mass, we're talking about minus 100 delta T. But shell is going to be about 15. So that's, that's not an issue. The viscosity of the CO2 is about 120th the viscosity of water at the same conditions. So that means the pressure buildup is going to be far, far less than you would expect. Before. So the pressure bulb will be relatively flat and will propagate great distances, great distances. So you're not going to get a large delta P like you get with hydraulic fracturing. Uh, in fact, they're not even going to go up to 70% of the overburden. They're going to stay below 70% of the overburden. That's very conservative. There's a lot of injection projects going on here in the United States and Canada where the companies are allowed to inject up to 85% of the overburden. So they're going to be pressure controlled. So the delta P is going to be falling off according to a standard you know, standard fall flow law. And it's going to be very, very regionally extensive. Yes, many, many kilometers. The third point is that the stratum is relatively limited in height. And the reason I say that is that there's another factor in CO2 is that it's buoyant. CO2 uh, at those conditions has a density of about 0.66. And the saline water at those uh, depths near the salt uh, strata has a density of about 1.2. So uh, that's a big difference in, in uh, the, the, the density. So that would give you a lot of buoyancy to the CO2. So you can imagine that if you had a very, very high column of CO2, like say 500 meters uh, high, well, 500 meters times G times 1.2 minus 0.65 gives you a huge pressure at the top of that column. But their reservoir is only about 30 meters high. So the buoyancy effect from the low density of the CO2 is not going to have a great big effect. So you know, when you parse as much as possible what they're going to do, it looks like their risks are vanishingly small uh, with respect. Oh, also, there are no known faults, no tectonics, no history of any ground movements, no high differential stresses in that region whatsoever. So it's, like I said, an ideal, an ideal, an ideal situation. You probably would not so enthusiastically approve of uh, large CO2 injection projects in reservoirs close to active faults, like in the Los Angeles Basin. Probably not. Much, much more, much, much more 
delicate situation, shall we say, and much higher population density. Than other things. So, no. so we think it's safe, but. have some different sites right, on going or completely. So um, in terms of the delta T, it's a 50, per, uh, 50 degree or 70 degree. So do you have a big effect in near the injection well for this uh, kind sure. of? Sure. If you, if you have a delta T of 70, uh, then, then basically it's, what, what's happening, of course, is that the heat is being carried in convectively, and it's heating up the mineral. Now, the, uh, if it's CO2, the specific heat of CO2 is, uh, what is it, one-third or one-quarter the specific heat of uh, water? Is that correct? Something like that. Uh, CO2 is much, much lower specific heat. So it's going to give up all that heat to the near rock environment. Okay? So that the CO2 will move this far out, but the temperature zone will only move that far out, but the pressure zone will move, you know, way over there. So it now becomes a matter of scale. How big is the delta T zone with respect to the rock mass and the structures in which you're injecting it? So now what you have to do is some mathematical, com numerical computations. Or instead of doing numerical computations, start out with a simple, you know, uh, uh, inclusion, thermal in inclusion uh, type of a model, which gives you a first order approximation, which is, you know, then tells you what you should do in, in mathematical models. I, I think the one problem is the injectivity. Can this kind of effect? increase the injection. Absolutely, if you're cooling. Cooling, definitely yeah. cooling. If you're heating, no. Yeah. Well, for example, for at the ground field in Texas, the in situ uh, temperature is 126. Sure, and you're going to be but injecting the, at? So the, the temperature is about the 70 degree. Yeah. You see? The, the, and you can be very sure that your, that your rock mass down there is naturally fractured. Uh, but the, but the, the, right? other so the fractures are going to open. Yeah, but on the other side, the sandstone is kind of unconsolidated. Ah, oh, do, do okay. In that case, that, in that case, that, then that's a good point. Uh, we, we find, in the petroleum industry, we find that the stress, I'm sorry, I don't mean to use the royal word we. I tend to identify myself with the petroleum industry, but I do other things, so I apologize if I say we. Uh, in the petroleum industry, we've done a lot of work, sorry, the petroleum industry has done a lot of work on uh, unconsolidated high porosity sandstones and the effects of stress. And we generally find that over the range of engineering stresses that we would expect, the change in permeability is only about 15 to 20 percent. But in a fractured rock mass, like igneous rock or shale gas, the change in the bulk permeability, if you will, or the fracture conductivity, is two or three orders of magnitude because of the thermoelastic effect on fracture aperture. So it really depends on the nature of the rock mass that you're putting it into. Now, there's another thing to be a little bit worried about. Suppose that your cap rock is a naturally fractured rock. It, you know, you're injecting into your unconsolidated sandstone, but your cap rock is a naturally fractured rock. You're cooling things down. That cool is going to propagate conductively into your cap rock. Are the fractures going to dilate? If so, you might build up fairly rapid convective heat transfer through these thermal conduction cells. Cool the cap rock, lower its horizontal stress until you get to the point of hydraulic fracture. I can show you the calculations. She's quite right. Hydraulic fracture can occur in CO2 uh, operations. We just have to figure out the, the physics and come up with a, a, a way of evaluating the risk of these things. And it might cause us to change the kind of nature of the reservoir that we wish to, that we wish to put uh, CO2 into. Like I say, the Shell Quest project in Alberta with three separate salt zones, I, 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 could not, I, couldn't, I couldn't design a better repository. They just have, because salt, even if you cool it down, it, 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 it doesn't, it's not going to crack, it's going to flow. It's going to undergo creep and redistribute the stresses. So it's a wonderful material. Well, the biosolids is not a profit so much. It's just good disposing of it. There are... In, in Los Angeles, it's very expensive to get rid of, uh, of biosolids because they have to undergo tertiary treatment to get rid of nitrogen and phosphorus. Then it has to be put into a truck, and it has to go all the way up to Bakersfield and spread on some field up there. And you can only, you can only spread so much on one field in one year or, or five years. So they have to have a whole bunch of, of farmers that accept 
that this biosolid sludge, which incidentally is high in metals, in heavy metal content, and also has uh, prions in it, but we don't know if the tertiary and secondary uh, treatment for the sludges is killing the prions. Prions are very resistant, you know, mad cow disease prions, is, that's a prion disease. So uh, I always think that my daughter drives a prion, but it's actually a Prius, so I can get, get confused sometimes. So uh, the biosolids uh, uh, injection, uh, we, we tried to, when I was first starting uh, working on this here with some colleagues, we used the word disposal. And the moment the word disposal came out of our mouths, the city of Los Angeles engineer said, no, never use that word. This is biosolids treatment. All right. So the biosolids is mainly carbohydrates and lipids and a lot of solid material. So it, it, it goes into the cracks, slurry, the, it goes into the cracks, sorry. It is forced into the ra rock by fracturing, uh, by mixing the, the sludges with about three parts water and one part sludge. And that creates a, an injectable slurry. Then when you stop injecting, the pore pressure starts to dissipate and the cracks or the fractures just simply close onto the solids. So now the solids are completely, totally trapped. They're completely immobilized. They can't go anywhere. Then, biological processes start to take over and you get the anaerobic methanogenic uh, bacteria down there generating methane. Interestingly enough, for every kilogram of, uh, of uh, biosolids, you should generate about 160 grams of methane. And the DOE that uh, put in some money into this project with the city of Los Angeles, their interest was methane, or if you wish to call it energy recycling. And uh, indeed, you're right. The, the biosolids is a propent, but not a propent in the sense of enhancing the permeability. It's just a solid material that we're forcing, forcing into these cracks that we're creating. Yeah. Yes, of course, because you're pressurizing and reducing the perme changing the permeability of a larger and larger volume. Yes, indeed. We see that on all kinds of waste injection projects, indeed. On all of the injection projects everywhere in the world, we see the same kind of trend. The, uh, the uh, injection pressure that we can uh, use to achieve a certain rate gradually, gradually is climbing because we're blocking the permeability and we're also changing the stress fields. We're actually increasing the stress, so therefore our injection pressure to overcome the local stress fields has to be higher. Now, a lot of these injection processes, it goes up and then stabilizes. And we see this in the North Sea. We see this in the Indonesian uh, injection project that I showed a picture of. Uh, then it starts to becoming. Then it starts to come down to: Are the cap rocks and the surrounding rocks leaking off the pressures adequately uh, at a sufficient rate for us to uh, continue injection without impairing the security of the cap rock? And that requires some careful measurements and study. And I haven't been affiliated with the Los Angeles project uh, in the last four, five years, uh, last three years. So. I can't comment on that, but I do know that in the Indonesian projects and some of the other waste injection projects, the company that does the injection and the oil company sit down and work out some kind of a protocol where they sit down and decide how long they're going to, uh, sorry, uh, uh, until what level they're going to inject, and then they say, all right, that well is done. We're going to use it as a monitoring well, but we're not going to inject any more, and we're going to drill another well. So in Indonesia, uh, the amounts that have been injected per well have been on the order of 2 million barrels of slurry, of which maybe 0 0.1, 0 0.2 million barrels has been solids. And then they move on to another well. So I think they're on their seventh well now. So they've been going for 14, 13 years, 14 years. So, yeah, there is a limit. You just can't do it indefinitely. So in the Los Angeles project, they drill two holes, one for monitoring, one for injection. And soon they're going to move to the other in the other one that is used for monitoring, and 
injection period. Yeah. 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 yeah the, indeed. Yeah. Indeed, uh, these uh, these things, and like I said, our models are not all that great, so we have to take measurements. What we often do in these projects is we take measurements not only of the pressures. We also go into the wells and do stress measurements uh, by hydraulic fracturing, but we also measure the uplift of the ground surface to give us an idea of how far out the solids is going and the kind of strains and deformations that are happening in the reservoir. Unfortunately, we're not at the point in our modeling yet where we can use that to calibrate models. In fact, <laughs> I'm not going to make it in time, but on Monday I'm supposed to be putting in a proposal on, on uh, to the government for exactly uh, this 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 uh, question, uh, developing of uh, hydraulic fracture models using a technique called extended FEM, XFEM, which is designed for fracture work, uh, to see if we can come up with better modeling uh, uh, results for uh, uh, these kind of very complex hydraulic fractures. I'm not optimi optimistic that we'll uh, crack the problem. It's a very tough nut. So what do we do? Monitor, monitor, monitor. Try to see changes. Try to come up with rational limits and maybe be a little bit conservative. That's all we can do. Oh, deformation measurements, deformation measurements, deformation measurements, and then deformation measurements. Okay? The, the petroleum engineers, they think nothing of taking pressure measurements and temperature measurements because that's what they need for their diffusion-based flow models. In order to calibrate our stress-strain models, we need deformation measurements. That's what we have to have. But instead, we work with the oil industry and they say, well, we'll give you pressures, we'll give you temperatures, we'll give you rates, but we don't want you to spend any money doing deformation measurements. They are absolutely critically vital to the calibration and development of the mathematical models of stress-strain. So, Tilt, which was, you know, largely developed originally in the USGS here in uh, California uh, to monitor this uh, little, uh, little linear feature out here on the other side of the bay. Uh, deformation measurements using uh, fiber optics gauges, which are sensitive, uh, and we're putting them into the mines right now in, in Ontario, by the way. We have about three of them installed. These are uh, precise to about one in, well, the, the company claims one in 100,000. Uh, they're actually more like 1 in 15 or 1 in 20,000 uh, parts, which is still enough to do good strain measurements in linear elastic rock. Uh, uh, tilt, tilt. Uh, we can measure the, the tilt very, very precisely so that we, if we measure the tilt in a number of areas, we can constrain what's going on in deformation. That's really important. If we're going to inject, you know, 200,000 cubic meters of poop or sand, we'd like to know where it goes. And the only way we can do that is through deformation measurements and inversion. That's okay. Inversion models. Right now, a lot of our modeling is what we call forward optimization. We do a complex model and we fiddle around and do a complex model and fiddle around. I think that there's a lot of scope for combination of, uh, of uh, forward finite element models or forward continuum mechanics models combined with some form of more rapid inversion. Because this process of doing parametric analysis or doing uh, uh, inversion with a finite element model, it's, it's just hopeless. Uh, it's just hopeless. It takes so, so much time. So that in the mathematical areas, there's a lot of developments that can be done. And I believe most of these developments will be joining together different techniques. Like we join uh, boundary element models together with, with finite difference models in order to simulate these fractures. And we couldn't do it with one or the other. We have to have both. So we try to take the strengths. So I think the deformation or stress strain models with some better inversion uh, models coupled together might be a, a direction to go. Uh, in the whole area of biosolids injection, uh, we haven't yet done the, and I don't think anybody has done, USC did a bit of stuff on that. Uh, how rapid is the methane generation under what conditions uh, and how could the methane be recovered? Because if 15% of the mass of the biosolid gets converted to methane, you know, we're talking real dollars here. You know? So that's, a, that's another issue. Uh, microseismicity, microseismicity, microseismicity. The trouble is, is that we don't really fully understand what microseismic work is telling us. And Art will spend hours talking to you about that. 
we take these measurements, and we've been doing it for, in the mines in South Africa since when? 1950s? I think something like that, late 50s, early 60s. So it's 50 years we've been taking microseismic measurements, and we're still not sure what they're telling us. And to give you an idea how, how important this is to the petroleum industry, they funded a couple of professors in Edmonton and Calgary it's called the Microseismic Consortium. And there's about 20 companies funding them, a whole bunch of students to try to get some advances in the monitoring side, in the microseismic side. Everybody loves microseismics, but when, at the end of the day, we're not exactly sure what it's telling us. So those are absolutely active areas that, uh, of research where major contributions can be made, I believe, uh, by by some good thinking. Yeah. Sure. Uh, for example, I was exposed to a person who, uh, yesterday, who was considered by many to be out in left field, far left field, who has demonstrated that when you stress a, an igneous rock, you actually, can gen you actually generate a current and a voltage field that can be sampled. So let's take that in the inverse mode. If I can sample a voltage change and uh, current flow in a project like hydraulic fracturing in some remote uh, uh, system of electrodes, can I back calculate that? to determine the stress change on that rock mass? That's a very interesting question to me. Just demonstrating that you can generate a voltage by stressing a rock to me is, as an engineer is, oh yeah, that's cool, you know, but the, the inverse would be very interesting. And I'll, I'll actually make another comment here. Even though companies like, or agencies like Sandia and, uh, and, uh, and, and Lawrence Berkeley have put in a lot of money into an investment into the monitoring of electro, electromagnetic EM type monitoring of various types, magnetotelluric, uh, 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 resistivity tomography, these kind of things. These methods are really, really underutilized in North America. They really are. There's a huge potential for developing these kind of techniques to give us more information about what's going on down below. And they're not being used uh, so much uh, for that. Uh, again, if you are taking deformation measurements with satellites, for example, uh, INSAR or even aerial photography, uh, inversion models to take this kind of deformation field at the surface and tell us what's going on three kilometers deep where we're injecting. Uh, we do that right now with tilt meters, but as you know, tilt meters are very expensive and the technology is owned by Halliburton, so it's even more expensive. You know. Dick, Dick Cheney, you know the Dick Cheney law? <laughs> Dick Cheney Law said Halliburton gets 10% more than any other, any other company, right? Yeah. So yeah, the electromagnetic uh, field is a good one, I think, to, uh, to focus on because there's a lot of potential there for these, these types of projects. Yeah. By strain, displacement, yeah. Yes. Oh, well, that's just a good question. Is it a mechanical connection or a hydraulic connection or both? It could be either. You could create enough mechanical strain to cause shearing at some distance without getting a pressure response there. But it is widely believed in the, in the industry that it is a pressure response and a mechanical response at the same time. But it could be one or the other or both. I agree. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But your your observation in the general sense is quite correct. 
And these slides can be made available to you through uh, Sarah, of course. Thank you.